Hi guys, Wargamer Dad here. Uh, welcome to, once again, a uh, late episode. I am going to try and sort of deal with that and uh, get a good one up today. Um, but today we're going to be reviewing issue 15. Uh, if anyone's interested why I'm late, uh, I've had a bit of an all hands on deck week. I left one job to go to another job and by the time I got all the paperwork and training through from the second job, it had completely vanished. <coughs> so I've been running around like a blue ass fire. And I do this mostly as a hobby. <coughs> but that aside, episode 15, episode 15, issue 15. <coughs> we've got a pretty good issue this week. Um, we've got the flayed ones, which we have five models for, which is pretty <coughs> pretty freaking awesome. And we'll be given away at the end of the video to one lucky subscriber. Good comments. Sorry, plastic. These models are, frankly, in my opinion, some of the coolest models and some of the most flavorsome models that Necrons get. They are also, however, probably the most breakable and delicate models that Necrons get. You've got a lot of long protruding bits, a lot of very, and you can see how narrow this bit is, very narrow bit sticking out all angles. <clears throat> another problem you're going to have, sorry, another one where you're going to have the same problem you have with a lot of other uh, cool but delicate models. <clears throat> They'll be great at your house. <clears throat> if you want to transport them, are going to be a bit of an issue. But uh, still pretty fantastic models. You've got five of them, and if I go on GW's website, for a pack of five, it is $31.50. That is not cheap for a pack of five models. Uh, let me just check the description, make sure I'm... See, it doesn't tell you how many models you get in, in the pack. It's just a picture of five models. Uh, do, 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 do. First, they can have a quench, more macabre, blah, 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 blah. The models and scary. So let's see if I can't. <clears throat> yep, the pack is for five uh, flayed one models uh, when you buy it. So, uh, <clears throat> and this has five bases and five models in it. So, I mean, that's a fantastic saving. I mean, I may sit there and look at the site and go, wow, 3150 for. Five models, but it is worth rec it. Yeah, it is worth remembering. No, eight ninety nine for five models. So, <clears throat> as much as GW are trying to make money, <clears throat> they are clearly also trying to make the game accessible where they can. <clears throat> Which, as somebody with very little money and no job currently, <laughs> I really appreciate. Yeah, so you are saving £22.51 if you buy the magazine. So if you're a Necron player, go out and get a couple of these. Hey, go out and get three of them. You can get three squads of flayed ones currently for less than one squad would normally cost you. That That is insane. I mean, unless there's something I'm missing, so you've got five bases there. Let's double check because they have been sneaky on models before. <clears throat> Easiest way to do it is to count the main bodies, which at this point is the spine bits, which we can see here. So <clears throat> one, two, uh, three, four, five. <clears throat> yeah, uh, <clears throat> unless I'm missing something, it does appear to be five models on this sprue. <clears throat> so Feel free to to contradict me if I'm wrong and send me a correction. <clears throat> but if this is a yeah, if this is a full sprue, which it very much appears to be, that's one of the best savings we've had. <sighs> uh, <clears throat> yeah, so if you're a Necron player, absolutely fill your boots if you can. Definitely one worth getting. Um, the models are 
yeah, the models are very intricate and very detailed. <sighs> You've got a lot of spines and fangs and bits of flesh <sighs> going over them. If we just look at the description of the flayed ones. Um, yeah, down there. <sighs> flayed ones, sorry, flayed ones. Keen, shrill hunting cries as they fall upon the foe. Talons flashing, infected with the gruesome flayer virus. Uh, do, 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 do. <sighs> Covered in macabre remains of the latest victims, the flayed one stalks into battle, striking swiftly from the darkness. <sighs> Their hunched stature, long claws and flayed skin make them stand out um, against other Necron units. <sighs> it says it making them, an, uh, making them an ideal audition, but certainly it gives you a lovely contrast with all that metal, you've got flesh and stuff here. <sighs> Flame ones are basically a terror troop. Um, let's have a look. <sighs> yeah. <sighs> They're basically a terror troop that's designed to be really quite scary. <sighs> As I say, they've got... <clears throat> they've got a lot of claws and details. There's heads. Do I have five heads? <sighs> There's one head. There's a second head. There's a third head. And there's a fourth head. And there's a fifth head, yeah. <sighs> After some of the uh, lower value ones that <sighs> that we've had with the paints where <sighs> the value for money was still okay, but not, <sighs> not brilliant. This one is a very welcome change. <sighs> like I say, if someone's got a spare copies of these in their shop, and you collect Necrons, get more. I mean, like I said, you could get three of these magazines, get 15 flayed ones, and be paying less than you would if you go into the store and buy them. That's that's insane. Uh, but at the same time, um, that's a thank you GW or and Hatchet Part Works moment, because, yeah, you just... There are a lot of people like myself who just would struggle uh, to get into the games at those prices. I mean, I go into GW every now and then. I go into uh, my friendly local gaming store, and my friendly local gaming store does a significant discount um, on 40k stuff. But even then, <sighs> I look at stuff and it's like, mm. you know, some things I can buy, a lot of things I look at and it's like, that is really beyond what I can justify. So uh, the um, the Imperium magazine and its predecessors have really allowed me to collect um, a lot of stuff. One of the reasons I went with Space Marines was because, despite the fact they've done Space Marines twice, <coughs> Space Marines are their favourite thing. So it's exceptionally likely they would do Space Marines again if they kept going, if this basically worked. <coughs> As a business one of them. <coughs> and it has. I think it's one thing of if they're getting people in and those people are just buying one or two extra boxes yet yeah. being able to play the game that's got to work for them <coughs> as well you know I kind of assume like I say that they're uh, clear, using it to clear excess stock but <sighs> either way I don't really care um, start with the magazine on the inside uh, page signed by our by our Necron overlord Ian and straight into the flayed ones. <coughs> flayed ones. I'll do the next one. I'll try and do the next one. I can't remember what the next one is from episode to episode. Flayed ones are monstrous necrons affiliated by a mysterious curse that compels them. I went into Dr. Evil then. That compels them to attempt to devour the flesh of the living and take their skin and bones as trophies. <sighs> yeah, basically, uh, they attack normal creatures um, and try and skin them. It's got a basic... Um, oh, it's got a nice explanation here. Long ago, the Catan known as Landugor the Flayer was destroyed by the Necrons. It is said with his last breath, he cursed the Necron race. This curse resulted in a creeping madness known as the Flayer virus. Those Necrons affected by this virus awaken with a degenerate hunger for the warm flesh and blood of the living. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> A 
kind of a similar in look to some of the ghouls and vampires from uh, Age of Sigma or Fantasy. <clears throat> Flay bonds are not only feared by their living prey, but by their fellow Necrons who believe the Flayer virus to be contagious. As the virus takes hold, their bodies are mutated, transforming them into blade-limbed monstr blade monstrosities. <clears throat> Flayed ones appear whenever the Necrons make war. Mortals who have faced them and battle know them by many names. <clears throat> so they've got some names. They've got some name charts, which I love. <clears throat> And some roles for degradations, mutations, and trophies. Uh, give you an example. One of the um, designation charts is the skin takers, and the other one is the another one at the end is the dread devourers. The degradations are screams at the sight of blood, or preys on the wounded, or runs on all four limbs. So um, you've got mutations, flesh stripping claws, legs enhanced for sprinting. Um, you've got trophies, wear clothes of human skin, rip out victims' spines. So it's all. All pretty cool. And they've got a thing which allows you to keep track of every unit your unit devours. So that's also that's also pretty awesome. Next we've got the Imperium Sanctus. This region of the Imperium has survived the opening of the Great Rift largely intact. Here the Astronomicon still shines brightly in this age of nightmares. However, no part of the galaxy is safe. Sorry, I should be doing the voice, I've got a bit of a sore throat. I shall attempt it in a minute. <clears throat> uh, the Imperium Sanctus is A, where the Soul Sector is, and B, where the um, <clears throat> where the Ultramarines and their sort of mini Ultramar Sector kind of are. And as such, it, it's always been the most well-protected area, and it's always been the sort of the bulwark of the Imperium. Now, with the... Um, with the Great Rift, um, that kind of dichotomy is even more <clears throat> obvious in that <clears throat> the majority of the armies of the Imperium are trapped on one side and the other side is very difficult for them to support. So, you know, the Imperium are very much, if not ascendant, <clears throat> certainly able to focus their troops on the one on a smaller area, <clears throat> so, you know, in the Imperium of Sanctus. Um, and what's well, not maybe <clears throat> losing or uh, being destroyed, <clears throat> and the Imperium is certainly more, much more beleaguered on the other side, you know, to the point where the Imperium Sanctus has a return Primarch, uh, the Imperium Nilhis has Commander Dante of the Blood Angels, who was he is awesome is not is not Gulliman. It's led some people to postulate that maybe we might see uh, we might be seeing a return of Sanguinius, which maybe we will, maybe we won't. He's one of the few Primarchs the where his death is pretty confirmed no one's 100% dead um, and you can't guarantee that they won't just randomly rise up um, but there are a lot of Primarchs who have returned stories written into them um, Lionel Johnson is supposedly hidden <clears throat> well Lionel Johnson supposedly vanished and no one knew where now it says he's hidden in a stasis chamber in the rock somewhere allegedly um, <clears throat> slowly healing in a very similar way to Gilliman uh, Lehman Russ just left, went out for a smoke and never came back. Um, so it's in, it's entirely possible that he might come back, um, particularly because uh, the Wolfen, who were lost in the in the Eye of Terror, have returned. And one of the uh, one of the theories is that he went into the Eye of Terror to basically just hunt down and kill his brothers. But we don't really know. Um, it's got a base. Further here, we've got a base description of the Soul System, uh, the Emperor Ultima, as I said. Um, 
the Empire Vault has always been one of the more stable areas of the Imperium, uh, which it goes into here. Um, <clears throat> one of the theories was that <clears throat> the Emperor had war Primarchs, which, you know, some people sort of saying, okay, um, these Primarchs are going to fight uh, forever, and then... Sorry, not fight forever. They were going to fight until the galaxy was conquered, and then the Emperor was going to kill them. But being as there were only 20, um, it looks like some of them were intended for continual war. Others were actually intended to build strongholds and defend the Empire. Uh, Gilliman, um, very much looking like an Empire builder and an administrator. Uh, Rogel Dawn continually building defences. Um, even Lehman Russ, who... who is known as one of the more uh, aggressive Primarchs. Um, his battle style was much more um, what they call sorties. They used to stay at home, you know, he's supposed to stay at home and have a lot of fun, drink, and then kind of go out and fight battles, go out and have adventures, meaning that some of, at least some of the Primarchs seem to have been built, so I'm just straight myself up, seem to have been built with the idea of sustainability in mind, Yeah, with, with some of the Chaos Primarchs also kind of looking to be built <coughs> kind of that way, but having been warped and made extreme by Chaos. Um, you know, certain Primarchs may not have been viable. Um, obviously, we're we're looking at... Um, <coughs> Pato, not Pato Rabbi. Oh, who am I thinking? Perfection Boy. <coughs> yeah, well, that's the thing. We're looking at a lot of them... Some of them look to have been more sustainable, but Fulgrim, that's the one. <sighs> Fulgrim, who was very much about um, the perfection, does look like he was initially designed to be able to guide civilizations and, um, <sighs> and build stuff before he fell to chaos. Uh, you've got Angron, who we really don't know what he would have been like before he fell to chaos. Um, because of the butchers now has turned him into something he was never designed to be. <clears throat> you know, uh, Potorabo, again, a siege breaker and a siege builder. <clears throat> yeah, there are, <clears throat> there are a lot of sort of places for, <clears throat> for sustainable Primarchs, <clears throat> even <clears throat> for some of the Primarchs, even on the assumption that a peaceful galaxy is possible you know with an empire spanning an entire galaxy <clears throat> the likelihood was there would always be skirmishes and battles enough for space marines at least <clears throat> but as i say uh, gilliman rabute gilliman was one of those problems where you can completely see what role he could play in a non-military empire you know he'd still have he could still have a, a limited number of space marines, but <clears throat> building, maintaining, and defending empires is clearly something he's good at doing. Um, and the Ultramar sector is basically a mini empire within the empire, which has caused eruptions in the past. <clears throat> Next, we've got Space Marine Chapter Command. <clears throat> Those Space Marine chapters are highly efficient fighting machines. They must contend with grueling attrition and numberless foes. To succeed, each chapter requires brilliant leaders with sharp minds who live and breathe the arts of war and logistics. <sighs> yep. <clears throat> Every chapter needs to be led by someone who's basically a battle genius because... You've only got a thousand warriors and you're constantly fighting and to just avoid being wiped out even through Pyrrhic even through Pyrrhic victories <clears throat> takes a lot of effort. <clears throat> and it is an effort that not all chapter commanders actually manage. Uh you know, and a prime example is uh the Crimson Fists. The uh, Crimson Fist chapter uh, were decimated uh, from a thousand Marines to two hundred and fifty Marines. 
due to a failure of their of their planetary defences when they all happen to be at home for some reason. <coughs> um, uh, there are plenty of other, you know, the Shadow Wolf chapter, um, <coughs> which is an Imperial Fist descendant, rather than a, a Space Wolf descendant, um, is a chapter the four is a chapter that died fighting Tyranids, I believe. <coughs> they're, they're, and they were they were held in very very high regard by the Black Templar chapter because the Black Templars saw them die. Yeah, and they basically said, "Well, this is if if you're going to die." You know, if you're going to fail, this is the perfect way to fail and die. Standing and fighting to literally the very last bloke. You know, the, they literally saw record. They saw they, there was one guy left holding the banner, shooting people when he got overrun by Tyranids. And, you know, to the Black Templars, that's the perfect way to die. There is no better way to die. <clears throat> so you really need military commanders who know what they're doing. Even the worst... Um, yeah, and by worst, I mean least effective space marine chapters have to be led by somebody who is professional. You can't afford to lose a thousand space marines just through stupidity. Um, also, it kind of shows where you've got to be getting um, more than one astronaut out of a space marine. Uh, it's one of my own pet theories, and I haven't seen it confirmed anywhere. If you have, please let me know. But I, I think that they harvest gene seeds from a space marine more than once, or grow extra ones. <clears throat> or at least I think they have to, because otherwise they wouldn't be able to maintain numbers. There has to be a way in which they're getting additional space marines. You can't just be having a space marine joy, harvest his gene seed. Harvest his gene seed and make another space when you need to be. There need to be other ways of doing that. <clears throat> so that's pretty cool. But yeah, this goes into how chapter command is built, um, what the command structure is, and <clears throat> roughly how they work, which is pretty cool. Um, we're running through. <clears throat> Here they've got a few of the, a few of the. Uh, Sorry, a bit twitchy. A few of the more well-known chapter masters. We've got um, Marnius Kalgar, who is the chapter master of the Ultramarines. Yes, um, obviously Gideman's taking more direct command of the Ultramarines, but Marnius Kalgar is a his right hand man, and b still chapter master. And in addition to that, it, it has been sort of noted on several occasions that. He doesn't just take charge of ultramarines. He takes charge of whatever chapters are in the area, and often ultramarine descendant chapters. So there are going to be bits where Goodman's off fighting places, and the ultramarines aren't necessarily, you know, aren't necessarily with him. You might have, yeah. You know, so Marius Kalga is still very much <clears throat> the commander of the chapter, despite his Primarch being there. He's also one of the first Marines um, of the old Marine style to go through convert the conversion process to a Primaris Marine, so he's also pretty awesome. <sighs> Next we have my absolute favourite, Logan Grimnar, or Beard, or you know, Wolf Daddy, as we often call him. <sighs> Got a lot of names like Behold Bear or Wolf Daddy and stuff like that. <clears throat> he's the chapter master. Of the Space Marines on his flying sled pulled by wolves. You know, I'm a Space Marine player, and even I'm looking at it going, you you shoehorned those wolves in there. <clears throat> you really did. It's a bit weird, but he is a badass character. <clears throat> You've got Commander Dante of the Blood Angels, who's the chapter master of the Blood Angels, and <clears throat> and the uh, the Regent of the Imperium Nilhus. You've got Kevan Kevan Shroik, chapter master of the Raven Guard. Uh, Pedro Cantor, chapter master of the Crimson Fist, as I just mentioned. <clears throat> they are one of the cooler chapters because they are very beleaguered. And then you've got High Marshal Helbrecht of the Black Templars. <clears throat> who was... 
actually been one of the cooler chapter masters. He's ironically probably one of the ones <clears throat> with the least control over his chapter, uh, kind of on purpose. Um, Helbrecht and Cantor are almost opposites in terms of uh, numbers. Cantor is... I say that, I don't know where the Imperial Fists stand at the moment. They may well have been rebuilt using... Um, using Primaris, but he was the chapter master of a beleaguered uh, group of only 250 Marines desperately trying to rebuild his chapter after the whole world um, was invaded by Orcs. Therefore, he kind of has the ability to sort of micromanage and really get in there, whereas Helbrecht is in charge of the Black Templars, and there are so many Black Templar Crusades who've gone off in different directions that even the Black Templars don't really know how many Black Templars there are. Um, some of the estimates put them at um, pre-heresy legion size, you know, being somewhere near 10,000 Marines, with field commanders commanding units of 500, 600, 300, and what's Helbrecht is technically the chapter master. If he had accurate knowledge and counts, of his marines he might be forced to tell the imperium that they exceeded their numbers so some of the rumors have it that helbrecht has you know deliberately doesn't know what's going on in some of his chapters or in some of his chapter <clears throat> because they've kind of expanded beyond that beyond the thousand number um you know he's all like, he knows what's going on but officially he deliberately doesn't officially know what's going on so that's pretty cool and there's a lot of difference in this. Um, <clears throat> different commanders uh, command in different ways. And Calgar very much from the back. Uh, but, you know, Logan Grimnar, Dante and Kivan. Logan Grimnar and Dante lead from the front. Kivan Schroik is very much about uh, the precision strikes. Which supposedly means a lot of these other guys are relied on to work on their own initiative. Yeah, they'll be going they'll be going for radio silence and all sneaking around doing things and then all of a sudden come out of nowhere with these rapid, overwhelming assaults, meaning that nine times out of ten there isn't time for them to stop, give orders and maneuver except in the most dire of circumstances. So, you know, each the each well he leads his guys overall and makes the plan once they're in combat, a lot of their units are gonna work uh, individually and independently and he's going to rely on his sub-commanders to know what they're doing and to understand what he wants from them so it, it's really cool with the chapter masters a lot of them are very very are very very different uh, some lead from the front some lead from the back some are very adaptable some um, have very very specific styles at which they really really excel um And it does cover a, a bit of that here. We've even got a quote um, from Achilles Zanaris, chapter master of the Silver Templars. Upon my shoulders rests the burden of command. The fate of the world lies in these hands. Yet this is a responsibility I gladly embrace, for I live to serve the emperor. To wield power in his name is an honour. Uh, that kind of goes on and on. <laughs> Um, but, you know, you've got really cool stuff there. And a brief description of Honor Guard. Um, I'm not going to read any of this because you guys want to read it. But almost every chapter master has a group of elite marines that A, make up make up of a sort of, kind of supernumerary strike force where they're the baddest of the bad. And if the chapter master himself feels he needs to intercede, he can do so with incredibly excessive and effective force, well beyond what you'd expect from the numbers. Um, they're also there to make sure the chapter master doesn't die, because if he is giving commands, and if he has to give commands, then he needs to be protected so that he's there to assess the situation and to give commands. Um, also, you'll often find that the honor go the honor guard also amongst his most trusted uh, warriors. So often you'll find members of the honor guard 
are put in charge of their own little operations. Um, on occasion. Uh, <clears throat> they go by various names for the space was the Wolf Guard, for the space uh, for the um Manis Kalgar, I think they're called the Praetorian or Vanguard or something like that. <clears throat> but each each unit has kind of its own name, it's kind of its own thing. And a lot of the honor guard are where you really see sort of the individualism of the chapters, particularly in the models. A, a prime example, you've got a um, you've got a uh, an ultramarine honor guard there. <clears throat> it's got the wings on the face. Got a lot of um, <clears throat> got a lot of very sort of unique <clears throat> ultramarine stuff, ultramarine iconography and stylisticness that you don't see on models outside of the ultramarines or their successor chapters. Uh, the wolf guard for the space walls are all in, are all completely unique. Uh, whereas yeah, you know, the honor guard for the ultramarines, uh, they can carry their own weapon. <sighs> Weaponry, they're often kind of outfitted in a similar way. Every single space, every single wolf guard is considered a massive hero in his own right, and you know they're the guys that are next up to be uh, company masters or even yeah. You know, <laughs> or even chapter masters and so they're considered individual heroes with unique sagas um, and because of that each one of them tends to be equipped in a fairly unique way in whatever way works best for them <clears throat> so yeah there is really a lot of variance in a lot of this stuff and yeah <clears throat> there's only a few brief things but uh, this is where some of the good stuff is and again as I'll almost certainly say in the back of this uh, look it up online you can really kind of make your own guys give me a second give you an idea I'm actually working on on a on a, a space wolf uh, successor chapter I'm just, I was going to try and do wolf spear but I kind of don't I'm not that thrilled with the color scheme it's cool but I kind of want to do my own thing plus I have kind of very minimalistic time to really devote to the hobby so i wanted something that was really quick so i'm going for a dry brush brass thing and yes he has a sword for a hand and yes i have been watching shang chi <sighs> and, and yes he yes he's he is blatantly a copy of razor fish from shang chi in space marine form but you can't stop me no 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 <laughs> but um it really, yeah, these are the areas that really give you the play to kind of expand your guys and make them look cool, make them be cool, make them individuals. Uh, particularly if you're looking to create uh, your own chapter, which <coughs> 40k very, very much encourages you to do. <coughs> okay, so <coughs> we've got the assembly on, <coughs> on the old ones. And uh, we've got a thing here, a nice little sort of indicator here going dry fit, telling you that a lot of these models can be dry fit. Um, one of the things about me is there's a lot of uniqueness in here and they're very delicate. So they are recommending that, that you dry fit the models first. Basically, you put the models together. In some cases, all you actually need to do is put them together. And they'll stay in other cases what you want to do is you want to just dry fit them to make sure you've got the right parts that you're trying to glue together before you glue them particularly with delicate models because the glue can get everywhere and you can damage models so that's that's a thing it's also giving some it's also giving some glue tips here which i really like um and it's something i do it's like you put the glue on and then if you've got a bit much glue on, <clears throat> use a bit of tissue paper <clears throat> and you'll just absorb some of the glue off so that <clears throat> so that you don't get glue everywhere <clears throat> and so you don't lose detail. <clears throat> These guys are fairly complicated, so <clears throat> it is worth reading them and following the instructions 
and they are fairly delicate so if you glue them together wrong it is going to be a pain in the backside to take them apart without damaging something so yeah this is these guys are modeling on hard mode obviously we've got the painting guide you can paint these guys any way you like and then we've got destroy the plasma site another mission using the scenery and the big orange map yeah you've got your large battle map and on this one you're just setting up the marines and a kineptic plasma site so this is nice because you're actually starting off with the flag ones in reserve <laughs> And they get they're basically let's have a look yep you've got the rule for teleporting here or rather as it's called in this one dimensional translocation this unit can start the game off the tabletop it can then be deployed in the reinforcement step of any necron player's movement phase that's an interesting wording any necron player if you're having a multiple-sided game you can teleport them in any time um They've got additional rule, Flesh Hunger, which is a special rule for them. Um, hit rolls of a six in melee score two hits rather than one. Roll the extra wound dice following the attack scenes as normal. <laughs> if you go through their stats, they've got a movement of five, which is reasonable. <laughs> weapon skill three plus. Uh, ballistics of six plus. I'm not entirely sure they have a ballistic weapon, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> there are instances where you can take over other weaponry which is why um, models without weaponry have um, rather often have a ballistic skill but yeah it's very rare you're going to use it you've got strength and toughness of four which is the same as a marine uh, wounds of one attacks of three um, and a save of four plus the flare claws are user strength AP minus one and one damage. You do have the ability to roll sixes, so you have a potential of um, of six damage, but it's it's unlike with with three attacks, but it's unlikely. So that that's pretty cool. They've got, uh, and again, they've got a rematch uh, if you play it. And you want to try it again. Um, when you finish the playthrough, you can play it using a Royal Warden in place of a Canoptic Plasma Site and the Primaris Captain in place of one of the units of Assault Intercessors. <laughs> and the stat size can be found in previous editions. Uh, yep. <laughs> Don't want, uh, yep. So, yeah, it goes through the movement. Um, on the first turn, it has the Flayed ones arrive as reinforcements. They are set up in unicontingency and more than nine inches from enemy units. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> it is worth noting you can that does put them within charge range <clears throat> of some guys if you roll well, but um, they're still pretty cool. So. <clears throat> And you've got the plasma zone running away to the edge of the table. It's worth knowing the reason you have a plasma site. Is because uh, one of the 40k rules, and I believe it is still a rule, is that if at any turn you have nothing on the table, that's it, game over, you've lost. <coughs> They've managed to destroy you. They're going to do whatever their objective is and then they're going to ask you before you get more guys on. <coughs> Obviously you've got... Several rolls there. <clears throat> with each, uh, with each Canopti guy having uh, three attacks, with a unit of five, that's potential of fifteen um, hits. If you manage to roll inhumanly luckily and get all sixes, you've got a potential of thirty hits for the unit, which is very nasty. Um, <clears throat> realistically, you've got a one in six chance. Of doing it so one in six out of 15 means you you may get one or two extra hits which isn't much but it can be enough to gradually swing the battle um, and it continues as you expect through that battle next 
standard insert in the back. Uh, as I said earlier, um, it's got you some of the stuff on chapter command and honor guards here, which is worth a read, but it's also worth looking at what the chapter guard and honor, what the chapter commanders and honor guards are for various marine chapters because it's really useful and really inspirational. Uh, you can really get some good ideas for a chapter you might like to make, or you can find a chapter that you want to copy. Uh, there are loads of chapters out there. <clears throat> some are people's personal chapters. <clears throat> Others are official canon. Some are both. Uh, it's what the, the Shadow Walls I mentioned earlier, which are, <clears throat> yeah, as a chapter that completely got wiped out, are actually the chapter or a chapter I used to paint, and I looked this on the background, turns out, they are actually canon because they're mentioned in one of Adam Dembski Bowden's books. But the original chapter is the chapter his missus plays. <laughs> as our own personal chapter. So that one kind of qualifies as both. <laughs> I'm always of the opinion that if you put your chapter out there, you're kind of saying that other people can play it. Uh, certainly if it's, a can if it's in canon and if it's a, a specific chapter that is definitely exists in the 40k universe then there's then anyone gets to paint it and play with it because that's how that works if however some people are uh, more protective if you look up a chapter and it's somebody's own personal chapter that they love that they made they might get miffed if you take it but at the same time there are you know there are so there are so many chapters out there you can use for inspiration even with minor tweaks you can get something cool out of and there is there is pretty much no way you can make a completely unique chapter if only for the simple reasons that there are a limited number of, there are a limited number of color combinations out there <laughs> that and you could drive yourself mad by making your chapter scheme too complicated so that it's unique and never get around to painting with them because it could take forever um, yeah, anyway, but finally, we're on to the back page. <clears throat> Next week, <clears throat> more intercessors, which makes me very happy because I just built five of them. <clears throat> so I'm going to be making more of them. <clears throat> might have to go and buy a... Might have to go and buy another box of um, old Space Wolf ones. I know my GW has one spare somewhere. Uh, mostly because I have been... Uh, <clears throat> I've been building my guys with space or weaponry to uh, and heads to maintain a, a kind of unique space walker feel so that's pretty cool and again we've got some more <clears throat> some more Minutorum armored containers <clears throat> this one is showing one container a bunch more boxes <clears throat> the boxes uh to my knowledge come with three container sorry the, the armor container boxes which they're sold in uh, seemingly bits of money which come with three containers in them so maybe that you'll be just getting one and more stuff but like i say it's good simple solid scenery and it holds together quite well so you can't really go wrong <coughs> with that if we look at the magazines uh, next week again assault intercessors updated rules reference and rules for large units which is cool <coughs> issue 17 we've got uh, munitorum armored containers Necron Dynasties folder and new psychic phase rules, which is again pretty cool. Um, yep, yeah, hope you guys enjoy that. Uh, I hope to see you next week, provided things don't get worse and and I end up completely broke. Um, yeah, uh, sorry, stressing out towards the end. My apologies. Um, yeah, I hope you guys enjoy this, and I'll, I'll almost forgot as always. Um, the Necro stuff is stuff I'm not playing and I'm not interested in. So this is going to be given away as a prize. Um, you need to subscribe to the channel and make a comment below. Uh, it can be anything, um, including just a dot if you don't feel like actually making a comment. <laughs> but I really do prefer when people make comments. I like to try and get conversations started and have a bit of community going there because, frankly, that's what the fun is. I'll see you guys um, next week. Thank <laughs> you.